In this episode of the robot series, we're gonna show you the final setup for the robot and also talk about our work holding strategy of how to actually hold the pallets in the machine. Now, you've heard my design philosophy of designing things not once, not twice, but three times. But in this case, it took a fourth. Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. Okay, so let's take a look at the first three designs I have, and then we're gonna take you out into the shop and show you the final design that's on the machine right now. Now the first design, it was so complex and so convoluted and hard to execute on, I got probably 45 minutes into it, realized I was so engrossed in the design, I had not saved it, I just closed it. It's a horrible, overly complex design I didn't even want to see it, but a lot of refinement went on in my head. And so I came up with the second design, which I did save. So here's the second design. Now it's got these cylinders here. Well, let me back up and tell you right here is uh, our PPS base. So that is the step file version that you can download right off our website. Um, now I've placed it there. And then these two cylinders, these are cylinders imported from McMaster. So the nice thing about Fusion 360 is you can just go up to this tab here, insert a McMaster car component, find what you want, and it imports the step version. So I did that. I also got some of these uh, accessories, these uh, pivots and things that bolt on to these cylinders. And I set them to both sides of the pallet. Now, obviously these are pretty powerful cylinders. And to get that type of power, you need a large diameter cylinder. And this is pneumatic, by the way. And so the PPS base needed to be on a riser. Uh, the next thing I did, brought in the size of pallet required to hold our own pallet. So this is kind of like a pallet pallet. Um, from there, let me get a side view. I wanted some type of pivoting system, like a, 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 like a cam that would, would have a a jaw that would move in and out and it would have a, a fulcrum that would maybe give a four to one ratio. So whatever the output of this cylinder was, it would be multiplied by four, plenty of clamping force uh, on the pallet itself. It's okay, but it would require a lot of extra components. I would have to fabricate some type of bracket back here to pivot on, of course, and, uh, and a pivoting arm here, some type of gripper to grip the pallet. Uh, complex, but off the shelf items, always good to use. So now the second design is very similar. Now this, this is a lot more simple. It also uses uh, imported designs from, or imported components from McMaster car, but they bolt on, they're, they're pancake style. So they have very short travel. And this time I actually got as far as modeling up some geometry here. So this, let me see if I can turn this off. Yeah. So there's a cylinder here that will go up and down and that would pivot on this axis here that would give kind of like a, a, a pivoting, a short throw clamp. We don't need a lot of throw like a conventional vise. We just need maybe an eighth inch or quarter inch at the most of travel. Uh, this would do the job. Now the problem with this one is, well, a few problems. It would also require the base to either be on a riser. Um, the way that we could get around that is if we hung these cylinders off the front of the table. But then I realized I made a mistake. These style of cylinders require a back to push against. So you can't just bolt the this face here to the bottom of the pallet, which I assumed you could. It would probably push it apart. It's in the McMaster description that it needs to push up against this back to exert the maximum force. So that was kind of out. So first one, totally deleted, didn't even save. Second one, too complex, too many products, 
too many components. Third one, decent, but I would have to keep designing. Let's walk out to the shop and show you what we've machined. The fourth design is actually gonna surprise you. Let's head on out. Okay, so here is the final design. Now the irony behind this is this is a vacuum work holding setup. We're a vacuum manufacturer. So some of the best ideas, I hate to say it, are right under your nose. That's why this fourth idea was the winner. Let me show you some details. Now first, we have the incoming airline go into our hand valve, Pearson branded hand valve then that provides air to our vacuum power unit. Now this may seem redundant, but what we have here is a vacuum pallet on our pro pallet base. Usually this is just a straight shot from the hand valve to unlock the base. The pro pallet base does not run off vacuum. It runs off of compressed air. Compressed air unlocks it. So once we have this pallet locked down, then we run the incoming airline to our vacuum power unit. Now the VPU, creates a high power vacuum. That vacuum is fed into here, this splitter, I'll explain that in a second, but it goes into it. There's a single inlet hole here that introduces vacuum into this gasketed area. Now we opted to use our 3 16th inch diameter gasket. We usually recommend eighth inch for pretty much everything, but we are putting a raw extrusion down on it. With that extra width of gasket, it can take up any irregularities in the extrusion profile itself. Now, the other problem with working with extrusion is that it's never flat. It's wavy, sometimes we get bars that are twisted, bent, cupped. So in this case, we wanted to make sure that we have it securely um, fixated to some type of top surface without rocking. So if I take any extrusion and I put it on a surface plate, you're gonna get it to rock. So a design principle, well, this is just a geometric principle, is a plane is comprised of three points. So we kind of use that geometry. We have these three work holding pads. Now these pads have little pyramids and they're sitting, well, we pocketed it, and they're sitting just about 30 thousandths above the surface of this pallet. So when we load our raw material on, it never actually touches this. It's sitting on these three pads. Again, three points make a plane. And these are just straight products off of McMaster. I wish I knew who made them. McMaster tends to hide that. That's fine with me. McMaster delivers twice daily to our location, one in the morning, one in the night. And so that's why we went with this. I don't know who the manufacturer is, but I'll put a link in the description below. So again, um, this feeds back. I'll tell you that in a second. Let me, let me grab a pallet and we'll put it on and I'll show you how solid it is. So here's our raw extrusion. The robot is gonna come here, place it on the, uh, just the outline. And now um, this is always gonna be in the on position. That means that we can control it with a solenoid. The incoming air can be controlled with a solenoid. So the robot doesn't have to interact with this knob, but I will for demonstration purposes. That button that went flush, when it goes flush, that's max vacuum. So I'll turn it on and if you watch right here, you'll see it get pulled completely flat. Pretty cool, right? So I calculated it out. This area here, it's just short of 2,000 pounds of downward holding force. Now that's good, but the times where vacuum applications fail is from the side loads imposed by the cutter. So those three pads with the aggressive pyramid-shaped uh, uh, cones, I guess you could call them, actually uh, imparts or imprints itself into the material, the softer aluminum material, just enough so this is rock solid. That is rock solid and that's not going anywhere. Hey, let's walk around back. I'll show you how we hooked it up back there. Okay, so we're at the back right-hand corner of the machine. Now, the Haases have their air and electrical cabinet here on the side. The UR comes with a bracket that we simply mounted to this door, 
and then hung the control panel on. So it's really nice. You have access to all the things, the internals, the airlines here for the Haas. And also it's just really convenient to have everything here. Now let's take a look down here. Now, the first thing that jumps out is these two canisters. What these are, are vacuum monitor switches. Again, we pulled these off of McMaster. Now this one here interfaces with the actual control in the Haas. It's called a fixture clamp input. We have that on all our machines that run vacuum. Um, if a part comes loose, the vacuum drops or is lost, this opens and the machine sees it as an e-stop. It's just a little safety factor that we have uh, hooked up. Now this other one, I would have hooked it up. I ran out of wiring connectors, so whatever, it's almost there. Um, this monitors the gripper cup on the end of arm of the robot. So we're gonna have it where it goes down to pick up the pallet. It meets resistance. It knows it's at the bottom. It turns on the vacuum and it needs to see that there is vacuum to this switch before it goes on to the next step. We'll put a delay. If there is a, a, a delay and there's still no vacuum, it'll send alarm and triggering our operator to come check out what the problem is. So that's a little bit of safety device because we want uh, to focus on process reliability when we're running robots. Now over here, we have a bank of four solenoids attached to a manifold. Now we have incoming air pressure and exhaust, and we have four solenoids with four outputs. Now the first one goes to the vacuum power unit that provides vacuum to the chuck, the custom pallet chuck. The second one provides vacuum to the end effector. The other two, we just have them plugged off. Uh, we could use that for blow off nozzles uh, magnetically mounted to the table, or we do have an air knife located alongside the spindle that we can turn on and sweep across the pallet a few times. So we have that capability. Now, if you're wondering how I mounted all this stuff, simply created a couple brackets. I'm not in love with them because the first design actually worked. Uh, technically, I should create two more, but they worked. They kept the ball rolling. Once we get the process running, then we can refine it. Speaking of refining processes, these hoses are just an absolute mess. Cable management is so critical with these types of things to avoid any confusion. We should not be using all red tubing, but that's what we carry in stock. So once we get everything dialed in, we're gonna zip tie things, we're gonna cut the appropriate length of hoses, we're gonna color code them, black, green, orange, red, whatever, and then tidy everything up. So this is a totally dialed in process. Now let's go take a look at the robot. Okay, so the first thing you might notice is that this vacuum gripper looks different. Remember the first version was just a straight rectangle? Well, when I installed the camera, I realized that this edge right here, sure enough, it was in the view of the camera. So we just put this back into the machine, did a little 3D surfacing, used a loft from the, the diameter of the lens of the camera to a circle out here and cut it. Then we flipped it on its uh, face and cut the groove. And yes, we lost a little bit of surface area, which cuts down the vacuum holding power, but it's so minimal. We may have lost two pounds of power, but otherwise, perfect. Now, the other thing we did is, speaking of cable management, we 3D printed these guides. So I brought in the UR model from the Universal Robots website and then I just overlaid a, a rough design and used this model to subtract the thick portion here so that it perfectly fits inside of these cups. Then we have a little boss with a hole in it and it just guides the cables. And I have it on this one, on this back cap, and again on this side cap. All three are the same, so it was a perfect fit for that. So it's time to program this robot, get it loading parts so we can cut some metal. And we're gonna do that in the next episode. So until then, go innovate your production. Hey guys, I hope that was informative to you. So right here is a card to the entire robot series playlist. And if you haven't already done so, here's a link to subscribe. So you got a few options. You should like click there, better if you click there. And then once you click there, notify button, you know, all that stuff. So a couple options.